Welcome to our podcast series, Talking with Traders, hosted by expert trader Garth McKenzie in London, from where he's interviewing various guests on the topic of trading. Welcome back to season seven of Talking with Traders. We're now into the fourth year of this podcast since it started in early 2020. Once again, IG have come on board as our sponsor for this season. We are truly privileged and grateful to have such a global leader in CFD trading as our sponsor. Over the coming weeks, I'll be interviewing various guests from around the globe on the topic of trading. Some will be follow-ups with past guests and some will be new guests. The idea behind this podcast is that you get a variety of views from a broad spectrum of market professionals. None of what you hear in these episodes is intended to be financial advice, but it is intended to get you thinking about how you might be able to apply what you hear here into your own trading and investing. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast in your favorite podcast app. That way you'll be notified when new episodes are released. Once again, thank you to IG for funding and sponsoring this podcast into its fourth year. And thank you listeners for tuning in. Please enjoy Season 7 of Talking With Traders. Welcome back to another episode of Talking With Traders. And this week, I've got a new guest on the line. His name is Austin Silva, the founder of ASFX. And uh, if you are familiar with the term ASFX or the name of that firm, uh, that's because we had Austin's colleague, James Bruce, on the podcast some time back. And now we've got the big cheese, the man of the moment, the man who owns the firm, the man who started it all, Austin. The big welcome. beard, the, right, right. The big beard, the big cheese. The big yeah, I beard. See, I, I'm, I'm loving yours too, bro. Since last time we spoke, you didn't have a beard and now you're following. It's good. We're setting the trend. You know what it is? We'll make James jealous because I don't think James can have hair on his head or hair on his face. So we're just going to make him <laughs> jealous which is fine <laughs> there we go well yours is certainly looking a lot stronger than mine um mine thank is just you, a, a relic from my holiday in spain and i decided not to shave it off and it's a work in progress that's good i love that I'll, i love i'm that. still deciding whether whether i'll keep it or not but i kind of like it i like so. it i think it's good it's, it's it's in now you know what i mean but i appreciate well, you having me on garth it's good to speak with you again always man like i really enjoyed our podcast i got a lot of good feedback so yes. anytime you'll have me on to chat you know i'm down so i appreciate that and i also appreciate you having james on he's a really really good guy i work with him every day and yeah. you know one of the things i admire about him and i have to give him credit for is he is a great networker with other guys in south africa which is yeah. cool for me because i would never get to meet you guys if it wasn't yeah. for that you know what i mean so i sure. give him a lot of credit for that. yeah yeah absolutely no he's a great guy Super. Well, Austin, let's get straight into it. I mean, I guess the first thing is um, I always like to find a little bit of background for the new guests on the podcast. So like in two minutes, just tell us a little bit about your background, what got you interested in trading in the first place and the path that your career has followed to get you to this point now. Sure. So I remember always being very entrepreneurial. Like as a kid, I would always have the lemonade stands. I was trying to do yard sales. I was shovel. I had a snow shoveling business. My first real business was um, a DJ entertainment business for private yeah. events. So yeah. I've been entrepreneurial. I was always looking to make money in an unconventional way. My, my brain was never like, go get a degree and get a job in a cubicle and work your way up the corporate ladder. Like that was just never on yeah. my radar. Right. So I get into financial services as a sophomore in college for a Fortune 500 investment and insurance company, mm. I find day trading as I'm working there studying for my Series 7. And I was like, this business is great. You know, Being a financial advisor is great. You can get residuals and make money long-term 100%. Untapped income, you know, kind of uncapped income. But trading really checked more of the boxes for me. So to answer your question of why, I knew I did not want to be held to the fire with a boss. I mm. don't disrespect authority. I'm very respectful of authority. My dad would tell you that I dis I am sometimes disrespectful <laughs> to authority, but I'm not. It's just I question things a lot. I want to know with fact behind what people tell me to do if I'm going to do something for them. So that doesn't really lead to wanting to work for someone else. So that was the yeah. first thing. I knew I needed to be able to make a lot of money because I knew things would get more and more expensive. And that's been accelerated now with COVID and inflation and everything all over the mm. world. Mm. So trading checked that box. And then really like I experienced as a young person, 
a couple of events with my family that showed me money is important to a degree. My I, my dad was an attorney. He did very well. So I did. I grew up, I would say, like a little bit above middle class. Very, wow. really, I'm grateful for my up, upbringing. Wow. So I was always around money, like the country club stuff. I was around that. So I knew you needed it. But because of the situations that I had experienced with some of the sickness and illness in my family, I knew that time was the most valuable thing. And trading checked the box of giving me time freedom. Like okay. yesterday, I have my in-laws in town. And I, as you know, I just had my son a few months ago. So we took the whole day off, went and hung out with them at the beach. I didn't have to do anything I didn't want to do. I took one call for some event that I'm doing coming up in London in December. But other than that, I'm able to move my meetings, move my week to have that time freedom. So it was really the income, the time, and then not having someone tell me what to do. Those three right. things, trading, check those boxes. And that's why I got into it, really. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Now tell us about ASFX. I mean, obviously the AS part, I guess, is the is your name, right? Austin Silva. You know what? Yeah, that is it. It's funny because like I never should have started ASFX and called it ASFX. I honestly think it would be bigger as a business, like a trading education business, if I would have called it something different. But I also would I don't regret any of the decisions I make. It's my personal brand. And when you're advertising yourself as I am, as a trading coach, as someone who's going to help coach another trader. I think the personal brand is important. I would look in like right now, I don't know if you follow college football here in America, but we have this coach, Deion Sanders. He used to be a player. Now he's the coach. He's like creating a huge attention grab. Well, it's not because of him as a coach or him as the working at Colorado. It's him. It's the personal brand. So I, I, Started ASFX really because I knew the personal brand was going to be what I wanted to grow. Now, that happened after I worked for a prop firm. Uh, it's T3 Live, T3 Trading. They're based in New York. I worked there for about 13 months. My wife was looking at how much money we were making. I was running a live trading room for them, selling courses for them. And I would make a set percentage of what the what we brought in as a business, as a brand there. I was yeah. running this live room called the Silver FX Live Room. Yeah. And people would watch me trade and we would trade Forex. So that's where the FX in the name comes from. Right. right? Yeah. But- I ended up leaving there because we just didn't agree on marketing tactics. Like I really believed in social media marketing and they were regulated. So they had to be careful with what they did on social media. So it just didn't jive again, like the authority thing, like, you know what I mean? We had friction. Yeah. So yeah. I, I worked there and I really, I never speak badly about them. I enjoyed so much of my time there. I learned so much, not just on like content creation and, and marketing, but also trading. Like I got to be on the trading floor with them and I got to meet Scott Redler and some of these guys that are super famous like on CNBC and everything. So yeah. that was very a really important point. But then my wife looked at, like I said, how much money we were making. She's like, she's got her marketing degree. She knew she had skills that I sucked in and I had skills that she sucked in. So we made a good match. And at this time we were dating or close to engaged. And she was like, let's just do this on our own. It's going to suck at first to get ASFX started and it's going to cost us some money. But if we go all in on this, this can be it for us. We can make this pop. And we did. Right. So that was 2019. And then since then, we've grown now you know, into a pretty popular, I would say, trading education business. Mm -hmm. I've got Tom, James, and now another guy named Evan that work mm -hmm. with me as uh, coaches that have been successful in the strategies that I teach. And they've taken it and made it their full-time business. A couple of them are trading private capital, like James speaks about. And then the other guys are with funding companies and prop firms as well. So that's okay, where that ASFX started and came from. Yeah. Okay. That's what I wanted to ask. So, I mean, are you, are you not a funding firm yourself? Do you- No, not do, at all. Do, do you refer uh, clients into funding firms or prop firms? Correct. So we- okay. What, what we do, my business, ASFX is now very simple to explain. It used to be I had all these video courses and shit to sell. And what I decided to do was simplify it two years ago. So two years into the business, two and a half years into the business, we fired our marketing team who was taking a piece of our monthly income, me and my right. wife. We, we felt like we had our ads running and everything up. So we didn't need them anymore. And they had us very productized, meaning we had a bunch of different products and a bunch of things going on. And I was like, as a customer, this is confusing. Let's simplify. Mm. So I put all the video courses into one package, mm. we sell that one package, one time right. fee. Okay. Then we have our live streaming service, which I know we're going to talk about. And then we have our coaching program, three legs, same stool. That's what I tell everybody. Very, very simple. So now it makes it easy for me to sell it. And I think if you're going to sell something, as you know, Garth, with your business and growing and selling yourself, it's got to be something you love, you believe in, and it's easy to explain. If it's complicated, yeah. it's not going to sell as much. So yeah. that was a big change that we made. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right. So I mean, we, we, I mentioned previously that we, we've spoken to James Bruce on this podcast before. And he, he's a mutual connection of ours and a member of your team, as you said. Um, yeah. I think what you do with live, uh, live streaming your trading days is really interesting and quite unique. Um, but I want to ask you specifically your for you, because I know some of the other guys like James does Forex and some of the other guys also, what do you specifically trade? 
right now, the yeah. last year and a half has been US 500, US 100, a little bit of Bitcoin and a little bit of US 30. I, okay. <clears throat> excuse me. I haven't traded any individual stocks and I haven't traded a Forex pair in two Novembers. So almost two years now. Okay, and so, I think it's because it just favored my interests. Yeah. So that's pretty focused, right? So you've got the S&P 500, you've got the Dow, which is, you know, that kind of similar indices, um, Bitcoin. Okay. All right. Very interesting. So it's quite focused then. What, yes. What, I, what, I, I used to believe in looking for a bunch of Forex pairs, Garth, mm. and I used to like spend a lot of time looking through a watch list, trying to find that play. And I think you become a jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. And then honestly, like, you know, from doing the podcast with me, I do two podcasts I'm filming at least every week. And I'm mm. talking to these guys like yourself who have 20 something years of experience. And I look around at them and everyone is very focused. No one just trades the whole market or all of the, it's always niched down when you get to the mm. guys that are top performers and guys that have lasted as long as you. So I think I took that from a lot of my guests. Stop looking at the big watch list, narrow the focus and just get better there. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's like that saying, of Bruce Lee he said what well, I don't fear the 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 guy who's tried 10,000 different kicks I fear the guy who's done one kick 10,000 times that is it that and is it and we, we, we actually philosophy. came up we we said in the group chat the other day master of or jack of all pairs master of none instead of jack of all trade yeah, you know there like you go. yeah over. yes <laughs> very true so on your website you you yeah. refer to a couple of st um strategies that you teach yeah. they're called the a1a2 D1, D2. Can yep. you tell me a bit about those strategies? And I mean, obviously, I don't ask, I'm not asking you to give too much away because, of course, sure. you sell it. I don't mind. I'll give it all company. the way. Yeah, I will. Well, I, mean, I, I honestly, I, I don't mind, Garth, because I say I put my best stuff out there. And if I put my best stuff out there, people will still come to me and want more. Yeah, you know, I don't hold yeah. anything back on my YouTube. I Because honestly, as you know, and you said it on my podcast, I could teach you the strategy that doesn't mean you're going to take in and make money. Trading yeah. is much more than strategy. Well, so strategy, exactly. Mm. You know, it's it's very foundational to me. But yeah, I can definitely yeah. explain those. Yeah. Definitely. Well, let, let's do that because, I mean, okay. it sounds like they are um, quite me me methodical, quite mechanical. Yep. But yep. let's go through them. I mean, let's do A1 and A2. What are those yep. strategies? Um, and then after that, we'll talk about D1 and D2. As I let my cat out of the office. So <laughs> A A1 is a breakout strategy. This is the strategy that we built first. This goes all the way back to 2016, 2017, when I started nice. to build a little bit of a community. This is before I worked at the prop firm. This is just me trading with my friends that we were all just trying to figure this out, like trying right. all these different courses and everything. And I read Mike Bellafiore's book. Well, I listened to it on Audible, mm. One Good Trade. And yes. that book really made it clear to me that I just needed to find a repeatable set of rules that gave me an entry signal. And I took that a step further. And I think this is why my business is successful because the strategies that we're talking about, the A1, the H, they're rules-based and they're repeatable patterns. So let's just break it down the A1 and the A2 because they're easy to explain. Yeah, The A1 is a breakout. The A2 is a pullback. In trend, okay. they're both continuation strategies. They are right. not mean reversion or reversal strategies. So mm -hmm. we have to any any strategy is one of those two. Or of course you can have ranging strategies, but in that case, you're still kind of trading either mean reversion or trend if you just zoom out. So it's a continuation strategy, a trending strategy. It's a breakout off of an EMA where we also use an RSI crossing what we call a market sentiment line. So okay. a candle formation is needed. We we're basically looking at engulfing formations to keep it very simple for everyone right. listening. Yeah. But what we're looking for beyond that is two things. So the EMAs, we want an 8 EMA above a 21 EMA showing a short-term uptrend. Right. And we want that candle formation off of the 21 EMA with a base off of the 21, not right. floating out off the 8 EMA because yeah. that's where we tend to find pullbacks then. So we want yes. a lower price as, as much as possible when we're buying and highest price when we're selling. Mm. But the thing that makes the A1 unique is on the RSI, that market sentiment line, we need the RSI, the relative strength above that market sentiment line. And the market sentiment line is just a moving average, but the thing that it makes it unique is that it's applied to the RSI. So it's applied to the volume. It is not applied to price action. So we're getting moving averages on price action and a moving average on an RSI, which tells me what is price doing and what is volume doing. So when they're confirmed, when I get that RSI above that sentiment line and I get that candle formation on my actual price action, now we have two different sources of information confirming that we are potentially in a breakout. Okay. That's the A1 strategy. It's a typical... Yeah, sorry. Guys. And 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 what time frame are you looking at with this? 
It's back tested when we did our testing on the 15 minute and the okay. one hour because we right. wanted to be able to position it to day traders and swing traders, but yeah. there's absolute it's fractal. So there's guys that are trading this on the one minute, the two minute, the five minute. It's very fractal, trading okay. it on the daily. So yeah. that's that's the A1. The, okay. the strategy that everyone's really trading right now in our group is the A2. And the reason for that is you'll find that the A2 will present and then you will get an A1. But what's the best price yeah. when you're trying to buy something? The lowest, yeah, the, lower the best price. price when you want to, right. And same thing when you're selling it, you want to get the highest price. Mm -hmm. So if we're in an uptrend, right. And price is moving higher when price pulls back and it breaks the 21 EMA, but 50% yeah. of the body is not through the 21 EMA. Yeah. That's our A2 signal. It right. has nothing to do with an RSI or anything. It's just a price action pullback. Okay. In that case, it's giving us a signal to say, Hey, if you think this uptrend where the eight and 21 are crossed up, if you think that's going to continue the break of this 21 EMA is the lowest possible buy price. And I want to buy it as it's dropping. And then as it comes higher and it presents that A1 entry potentially, that's where the older version of myself is actually getting in. But because this A2 strategy has me in down here and I'm only looking for one-to-one -one take profit on this strategy, yeah. I'm actually now getting out of my A2 trades where the younger version of me would trading the A1 would be getting in. So okay. it's really interesting to see. And this strategy, the A2, people love it. I mean, I think some people will talk smack about it. We could talk about this, but it's a one-to-one -one strategy that so, wins. We back tested it over 50,000 trades and it's one-to-one. Yeah. -one, it wins at 56, call it 55% of the time. So okay. right off the jump, if you took every signal, you're profitable. But of course, mm. with discretion, you want to improve that. Okay. So that, that's interesting because I was going to ask that if it's a one-to-one yeah. -one risk reward strategy of it, uh, you know, um, what is the six, what is the hit rate? So you say it's about 56, 57%. And, if and you, that's so over therefore, 50,000 trades, I would yeah, say, yeah. over different timeframes, over okay. Forex pairs, indices, Bitcoin, oil, a bunch of different assets. If mm. you niche that data down, you will see it outperforms Forex pairs when you look at it on Bitcoin or an indice. It's a When it trades well, when the A2 works well, is on a volatile asset, something that moves yeah. a lot because you'll get that pump on Bitcoin, a pullback, yeah. you'll get your A2 and it'll pump even more. Yes. So the gains on something that's more volatile tend to be better. So like when we would backtest NASDAQ, we just did a backtest on NASDAQ. So NAS 100 or whatever you want to call it, NDX. Over the last 1,000 bars, we were looking at a 15-minute and a 5-minute specifically. It performed at a 72% average out win rate on those. So way different, way higher than right. if you look at everything. And yeah. that's because some assets, it's awful on. When we did our seminar in London last year, we went so deep into this backtesting where we were going pair by pair. It performed extremely well on NZD USD, but yeah. it performed awful on CHF JPY. Yeah. Now, why? I don't know, but that's what you have to look at when you say, okay, this strategy over all these assets, it's 55, 56% win rate. Okay. Well, now if you look at guys like me that are trading it the last year or two, my win rate this past year was 72%, 73%. So I added, yeah. you could say 15%, 20% to the win rate just by avoiding some losses with some discretion. Yeah. So, and yeah. that's really where like the coaching and stuff makes a difference because I can teach the discretion in the live market better right. than I can teach that in a course. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And when it comes to risk, I mean, obviously you say so one to one risk reward ratio, but what are you risking as a percentage of your capital then? I'm personally never risking more than 1% per trade. Yeah. I haven't put 1% on a trade in a long time. So yeah. my typical risk, like over the last year, if you look at my data, I had about 90 trades. The average risk per trade was about 0.24%. So about a quarter of a percent. Some of them were 0.15, point very small. Some of them are 0 0.5, 0 0.75. So all under 1%. But I right. will say, of course, you're going to have people that are listening to this that are like, well, if you're trying to get funded or whatever, you got to trade with more. Yeah. I mean, of course you can put whatever you want to do 2% per trade and fail a bunch of challenges, go yeah. for it. Like that's yeah. on you. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what but about running? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, running. I mean, are you are you not ever tempted to try and run those profits further, you know or, or is your data tell you it's not worth it to, to I'm try lying and to you. I'm lying welfare. to you if I tell you I'm not thinking about it, Garth. Because yeah, of course yeah. I want to make more money on some of these trades where it rips. Yeah. Like the trade this morning, I'm out of it at one R, and it's now at six R. You know? Yeah. On, on yeah. Spot. Well, that's it's it. That's why I'm thinking today. some some of these big moves. If you capture them, you know they they can really run. They can pay. But mm. you know where it is for me right now. I'm much more consistent on my rules. I'm not going off tilt. I'm not oversizing. Right. When I have set business hours and I close my trades and I finish the day at that end of business hours, yeah. if I hit my one R, I'm done. If I'm yeah. at break even, I'm not adding to the position. I'm just managing. And if I'm starting to lose money on the position, we're going to cut it, walk away for the day. That's mm -hmm. the way that it's worked best for me. Just okay. have these set business hours. I'm trading the New York open. That's really it. Because okay. I go to the gym every day at 12 o'clock. So I got to be basically out of my trades, if not stop loss locked and just letting a piece of it run.
Yeah. But there are trade scars where I'm holding a quarter of a percent, a quarter of the size at one R I'll take off 75% of the position, lock the stop loss and let it run. If I think it can run, that's not as often as where I just take the full one R and move on. And that's, you know, you know, of course people are going to say, Austin, you're leaving money on the table. I'm not here to catch all of every move. And I think people can try to learn that from me. And I've taken that from you. And like I said, other podcast guests, the guys that survive and make this their full-time business, you don't need all of every move. You just need to make money get paid out, move on, rinse and repeat. If yeah. you can do that at 1R, why would you make your life more complicated? That's yeah. what I would ask them. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that, that was the A1 and the A2 strategy. Now talk to me about the D1 and D2 strategies. So they're a little more complicated. And I think that's why people have turned away from them as much. Like I don't have anyone I know really still trading them. People have shifted. I think that's because they require multiple time frame analysis. So the D1 is a pullback, in trend again to the 50 EMA. Often, what we would tra- like to trade uh, to trade the D1, you'll see an A2 present before the D1 entry would actually get you in. So in that case, the A2 is still, I think, an easier way to do this. Yeah. But what it is is, let's say we're in an uptrend, we pull back to a 50 EMA, we drop on a 15 minute. Let's say then we drop to a one minute and look for bullet. And we're in an uptrend. I want bullish divergence on the one minute. RSI would be rising. Price action would be falling. I then want higher lows so I can get some strength to show. And I'm looking for a 50 EMA break on a lower time frame to get yeah. long there. So it's a okay. bullish divergence when I'm long, a bearish divergence for shorts off the 50 EMA. Just trying to get, again, the lowest buy price and the highest sell price as much as I can. Okay. The D2 is fun. Because the D2 is where we find divergence on a higher time frame, like a 15 minute or a daily or a one hour. Let's say we're in an uptrend, but we find divergence on the top. RSI spiked on a Wednesday. We're higher on a Friday. So now we're forming divergence where the RSI is starting to fall. Price action is rising. As that divergence continues, we tend to either see chop or some type of a reversal. So let's say we get to like average daily range for the day on a Forex pair. At average daily range, where we've hit our average range for the day, some guys will come in and start to look at the lower time frame to find divergence against the trend for a mean reversion. The D2 is basically a counter trend reversal mean reversion strategy, okay. whichever term you would like to use. Okay. All right. Yeah. And are you very specific? I mean, these are the four, these are the setups you trade. Are you ever tempted? to trade something else, of course, you know, of there course. are, there are guys that love to shoot from the hip. It usually doesn't yeah, end course. well, but it ends terribly. You know, I mean, it we, always we, does. <laughs> how do you, how do you stop yourself from deviating or you just experienced I, enough not to do it anymore? I'm definitely not experienced enough. I don't think anyone ever is. Cause we're all susceptible to making mistakes. Like we're all humans. You could be yeah. trading for 15, 20 years, as you know, and I'm sure you still make mistakes sometimes. It's, I don't think it ever stops. Perfection is never what I've heard anyone talk about in this game. It's survival. It doesn't exist. It's, yeah. It doesn't exist. So yeah. the, the mistakes are always creeping up in my head, like, and they're always trying to come out, which is one of the reasons why I have those specific hours as a day trader to just wow. trade and then, you know, give the focused attention there. Um, I feel like the way that I'm able to not trade the off edge setups is I have pressure on me as a trading coach where people are looking at my daily report cards every day and holding me accountable to staying on edge. The community and the people around me, Tom, James, the coaches that will call me out if I fuck around. Sorry, I curse. If I mess around, they (laughs) will call me out on it. So I have accountability. I honestly think that's the only way. It's pretty good to have that accountability from other people because you're right. It does definitely help you to stick to the rules. 100%. Yeah. And you know what you do? I like again for the new guys. Sometimes like there's new traders who are like, "Well, I want to stick to my rules, but I'm so new. I I want to play around." Demo account. Don't play around with the money you're actually trying to make money off of. You know what I mean? Like you're mm-hmm. real play. If you have that gambler's itch, scratch it on the demo account. Don't yeah. scratch it with real money because you're just gonna get frustrated. Even if you make money today, by the end of the week, come talk to me. You're probably screwed. You know what yeah. I mean? So, you know who can have discretion? You. Garth, someone with 20 years experience. I would trust you to be discretionary more than someone else. I think people just rush to try to be feeling around the market. You don't even know until you see five years of the market. You got to understand the news. You got to understand the macro climate. I did not understand any of that year one, year two, even year three. I would say it's the last couple of years, year four, five, six, that have really started to lock this in for me and make it Okay, now this year we're focused, like today, we're focused on CPI, CPI and the Fed, the FOMC Fed funds rate. That's so important right now. Yeah. When I first started trading, NFP was the main event everybody talked about every Friday, uh, first Friday. Now NFP is not even that big of a deal. So it's like you have to understand market cycles and things are changing. That's when you can start to apply discretion. Don't even try before you have some experience, you know? 
Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes good sense. Yeah. All right. So, so I mean, I respect what you're doing in terms of educating traders and Thank you. um and and showing them what you do and putting your neck on the line trading live. I think that's very very commendable. But we know that a lot of trading is is about managing yourself. Um, yeah. so you can have these these specific setups that you've ref- talked about now, mm-hmm. but and that's all very well. But you've got to manage yourself. It's a, this is a eighty percent a psychological game. Right. 100%. So, I mean, how, how do you assist traders to be psychologically strong in in what you're doing? Well, it depends on who you're coaching. If you're coaching the kind of guy, like I, I think of some of the guys in the program right now, sometimes I think, let me back up. When you're coaching anybody, you have to set a standard of accountability, something that they build and they ask to be held accountable to. Once we do that, you're not going to ever have to yell at someone. They know whether they screwed up or not. They yeah. set the bar there. So I think that's why my coaching style and the guys like Tom and James that work with me, it, it works for us because we don't ever boss people around because we're not trying to make carbon copies of us. We want to exploit what traders are or who they are and make mm-hmm. them the best version of themselves. That's our goal. In order to do that, they can tell me the standard they want to be held accountable. Will I push on them in certain areas? Of course. Will I give them a, you know tips from people who have been coached in the past and what has worked in the past? Of course. But I want them to set the standard of what they want to be held accountable to. And then my job is to say, why can't you, imp- what are you doing outside of your trading that is keeping you from being disciplined on your trading? And I'm very lucky that my reputation has brought me really great clients at this point, which are entrepreneurs, other business owners, or other full-time traders even. So I'm working with these people who typically are not you know, college kids that need the trading to make their rent money. These are guys that have experienced success and have also deployed discipline in other areas of their life. So I look at them and I say, you've shown discipline in order to build your real estate business to this point or your whatever business to this. Why can't we get the discipline to translate to here? Well, because I want to make money. Well, because I'm a, well, I got this gambling addict. So then we can start to piece apart and they will admit what their shortcomings yeah. are. I think most of us would, yeah. but it all starts with the standard. If you say, hey, hold me accountable to one trade per day. If I win that trade, I'm stopping. If I lose, I'll take one more. I can hold you accountable to that. But at the end of the week, if two of those days you took four trades, I don't have to say anything. You just have to look yeah. in the mirror and deal with the fact that you yeah. can't employ discipline. And yeah. like you've seen on Twitter, I mean, the, the the number one thing is most people that get into trading won't be able to make it their business long-term, 20, mm-hmm. 30, 40. It's just not the way it works. Yeah. I think that comes down to discipline. Yeah. If you can't be disciplined, and I think that gets easier on the charts when you are disciplined off the charts. Yeah. So that's how I think you coach somebody to, to, to implement more discipline. You ask them, what do you want to be held accountable to? And then you do your job on the other half of that is even being a good trading partner and saying, okay, I'll hold you accountable. You know, yeah. like Tom and James, who are both coaches for me, they are both their, each other's accountability partners. It's not yeah. like they can go to one of our students and ask for that. So they have to do it for each other. You right. know what I mean? Yeah, that's very good. It's very, very yeah. good. All right. So now trading, as we know, uh, it can be quite a lonely pursuit. Um, obviously, it's a it's a skill that you can employ from your bedroom or from you know wherever, really. But With it can be quite on. lonely. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it, it can be quite lonely. So part of what you've done is is you've built a community um, within ASFX. So you know, I, I guess tell me a little bit about the community. Um, how people connect from around the globe, yeah. the sort of stories they share, the ideas they share with each other in that, in that community. So the way that we have it run is, and I know a lot of guys don't do this. A lot of people just sell a discord chat and then you get into this discord chat or telegram chat and it's craziness, right? Like ideas from all different strategies, all different chart layouts, everything is wild. So what we did is in order to get into the discord, we only have one you have to take the course. So that barrier to entry makes it so, well, number one, I've never had to kick anyone out because everyone paid at least $500 to get into this thing. So they're taking it somewhat seriously, but it also makes it so they speak the same language. They understand how I look at a chart and now they're looking at it the same way so they can help each other. Yeah. That changed our business. Ask my wife. When we shut down the free telegram and the and the paid tele, we shut that down and made one Discord for paying clients only, changed the business 100% because now they can grow without me having to answer everybody. Now they can actually step up and become a leader within the community that then holds them accountable. And then other people look to them. I have guys that have been with me for five years. I have guys that have been with me when I was at T3 and still follow me. So it's like, I think the reason for that is because this environment 
uh, like as a coach, I've created a, a mini microclimate for them yeah. to go and be the best versions of themselves. They don't feel obligated to do anything. They don't feel pressure. They don't feel like any of their ideas will ever be talked down on or they'll be made fun of. I think that's yeah. huge. So yes. people in the group are not afraid to ask questions. That's the thing. The guys, I have people, Garth, that'll pay the $4,000 for our mentorship and they don't ask questions. They don't do chart markups. They just don't do anything. And it's like, what do you want me to do? If you put yourself out there in my community or in, I would say in some others as well, people will help you. Really yeah. successful traders don't mind answering a couple of questions if yeah. you approach them nicely. You know, like, look at, you're in my podcast. How do you get yeah. people? Just approach them nicely. Traders yeah. are normal people. They yeah. want to help. They know what it's like to be struggling. Most people are not going to be assholes to you. I think the guys that are mean when people you know, ask for feedback, it's because they're not confident in what they're doing. If I can help you, why would I not do that? Especially when I am growing a business as a trading coach. Yeah. So I think our community, it flourishes because the people support each other because they watch the same 20 hour, 30 hour video course. They bought into the same idea. They liked something that I said, or some, they liked my beard, whatever it is. So they're yeah. bought in on some common ground that they can then grow from without me having to micromanage every single person. That's why the community is good. I think the communities that suck are micromanaged by one guy mm -hmm. and that owner has to, he's the end all be all. He's nice to some people. He's mean to some people. My community is busy every day because I built it in a way that allows people, like I said, to just be the best versions of themselves or slowly become that and feel comfortable to grow. That's the thing. It's like we just said, trading is there's no perfection. So then it is looking for growth every day, 1% better every day. If yeah. you're around other people that agree on that message, you're going to feed each other and you're going to be very successful. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. It sounds very, very, very productive. But having and also, said that, I, would just, I was just going to say one more thing. There's a lot of negativity when it comes to trading. You are right. I'm wrong. I'm making money. You're not. Bro, you're one day away from making the biggest mistakes that you're trading and blowing yourself out. That's yeah. what people, traders are not humble enough. And I think what a good community can do is it can keep you humble, keep you a student of the market, a student of the game. The, th the second you think you know it, I think you even said this on my podcast, is when you're going to, you're screwed. You know, mm -hmm. you, you can't operate like that in this business. So uh, a good conducive learning environment. Yeah. You got to be humble. I think that's huge. That's huge. Mm -hmm. If you get into one of these groups where the guy is like, this is the only way to trade. This is the only way leave, just get out of it now because there's a million strategies. It's not about strategy. It's really yeah. not. That's the yeah. foundation. It's one of the one, one, one leg of the table. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. But now we, we know um, that within trading, the statistics are not good, right? Uh, I mean, three quarters of people who try this fail. Yep. Um, and, and that's not to say the other quarter are, are all making it big time. That's right. You know, there's probably three quarters fail. Another twenty percent struggle, and you know, trade yep. water, and maybe five percent do okay. And then there's like a tiny, tiny little thin end of the wedge that really makes good money doing this. Now, I'm sure that through the program and the education that you're doing, your clients most likely are more successful than those numbers that I'm talking about. I'd like but, to think so, but 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 I will. I want to ask you the question. I mean, are you? Do you still see, notwithstanding that, that you know, guys can go through the education, they can, you know, do it all and still end up just not making a success of this. Honestly, no, I, I haven't seen that. If the person I, and this is, this is just the truth. I haven't had someone buy the course and ask me for a refund ever. Okay. At a, okay. I've sold 2000 something courses right. since 2019. I've never had to give a course refund. I think because people see Number one, I am there in the Discord every day if they need help. I never leave messages unread. Nothing goes unanswered. So if you ask questions, I am there to support you. I think the people, what ends up happening is, Garth, they buy a course, they get into a Discord, and then life happens. Hmm. Dad dies. Son is born. Job fires them. And then trading takes a backseat. Yeah. And it doesn't become like their main thing. There's only a select, just like making a baby, bro. Not that that's maybe the best reference, but there's only one that makes it through. There's only a couple of guys that make it through where they give it enough effort. They ask enough questions. They grow enough. They follow the right financial, you know, I think guidelines to stay financially in a good place, financially solvent, not mm. digging themselves into debt. And then they actually come out of it on the other side, making money. There's very few people that come down that funnel. Yeah. And then again, like they don't have life get in the way. They don't have a job, screw them over or whatever it is. That seems to be, at least in my community, the reason people step away. Cause I've had mm. guys leave and then they come back. I've had guys that I haven't heard from for a year show up at my seminar. So I think it's sometimes life gets in the way and everybody's learning curve is different where yeah. it took me two and a half years to make one month of profit. Like I think everybody has a different learning curve where some guys can come in if they're 
in the right headspace and intellectually in the right spot, I think they can flourish very quickly. There's other guys that it's going to take them six months. I've got guys in our mentorship who are older, like older than you, really. They don't even use Discord. They're not going to have the same learning curve. That's going to take a lot of time to work with someone like that. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? So the difference in learning curves and then the difference in like everybody's off the desk outside of life stuff that gets in the way, I think is in my experience, more of why out of all 2000 people, not all of them are making money. Of course, the 90% statistic comes into play. It's not for everyone, but like I've seen people come from frustrated and not making money to now funded and making money. And I've Mm. seen it enough that it's clearly the content. It can make you money. It's Mm. does everything else line up for you to then allow you to succeed as a trader? Yeah. Are you having to work two jobs now? Cause you accidentally had a kid and blah, 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 blah. How are you going to make money trading versus the guy who has no financial commitment? He has no debt. He can work from home. He can give this five hours a day. He's going to crush it in the first year. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So yeah. That's the- I mean, I, I guess with everything you're saying there, you, you maybe have answered this next question, but I mean, what, what do the best traders do? What are the most successful traders do consistently that makes them successful? And, uh, and I guess conversely, what are those who are not successful? What are they it not is- doing or what are they getting wrong? It's definitely the work ethic. It's mm. definitely nothing about intellect or like IQ or a certain ability to do a certain thing on a computer. It's nothing like that. It's who is going to ask questions every day to someone who can give them more like good feedback, someone with more experience, and then take that feedback and try to get better. The guys who are getting better 1% every day, I know it's like the corny James Clear thing from his mm. book, right? Mm. But it is very true. If you yeah. mark up your trades in detail, like I had a guy who just joined the Blackshirt Club, seven trades yesterday, no chart markups. Okay. So we're going to get on a coaching call and talk about this. I got nothing to look at. What do you, how much growth is that guy going to get versus the guy who does the full daily report card, even though he had seven losses, puts all the chart markups in there, puts his thoughts on the chart. What entry did he take? Why did he like it? What was going on on the news? Blah, blah, blah. Gives me all that detail. Think about how much more that person can grow. Cause I can yeah. give you feedback on all these different things. Cause I'm the one with the experience. That's all you need is you need someone with experience to give you feedback and you need to put yourself out there and ask for it. If you do that, you will become successful in trading. Mm. And as long as you don't blow out financially, of course, you can, I think anyone can do it where it drops people off is in discipline and work ethic. And again, life happens. I understand. So I'm not trying to, you know, poo poo or, or talk down to people who end up having to pick up that other job or whatever it is, but then they should come back to trading when the time allows for it, when you can give it that effort, ask those questions and get that feedback from somebody. Yeah. 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 A lot of people, come to me and I'm sure they probably come to you as well and come with the story that they want to quit their job and take Mm -hmm. up trading because they believe that they can make a living from trading and they can replace their income from trading. Um, It's quite a scary prospect usually. And I usually talk people out of it as much as I can. Um, But I mean, what are some of the foundational elements that one would need to have in place assuming that you would actually say, yeah, cool. You're actually ready to go and try and trade for a living. I mean, it's a, it's a tall ask. I think it's it a is. very tall ask, but it's a tall ask. What, what, what kind of fundamental foundational things do you look for? Well, one, I think it would think be, of that? yeah, it would be, where are you in the world and what are your expenses? If you live in the Dominican Republic and you need a thousand dollars a month to live, this is a different conversation than if you live in Florida like me and have a kid and I need $15,000 a month to live a decent life. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think it's all about your expenses that first. Second would be no one should be just dropping one stream of income to pick up another stream of income that is a business where you're going to lose money. That doesn't make any sense. Trading is a business where you will lose money some months and some years. Mm -hmm. Why would you quit and cut off one stream for a stream that could actually hurt you more? Like that mathematically just doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah. yeah. So the, the best advice for those people, figure out how much money you need to live. I would also, in the meantime, before you quit your job, pay off all your debt, get rid of everything. And then once you know how much you need, you need a safety net and and I also think not just a couple of months, I would really say a year safety net at mm. least. Yeah. And I would not just go all in on trading. I'm the same as you. I do not recommend that for anybody. I think having multiple streams of income is the only way to ensure that you and your family can eat during whatever 10, 15, 20 year period we're about to go through with mm. very high inflation, things continuing to get expensive. Why would you want to risk your livelihood on just one thing? What if your brokerage gets shut down? What if you get banned from trading because you're in this one country that's now banned from trading the asset you like to trade? It does. It's too much eggs in one basket. So yeah. whether you start a new business 
business and you just do a little side hustle in your non-trading hours. Trading is not an all-day thing. No one needs to be at the desk all day as a retail trader. You can make plenty of money without being stuck. So go out. Like I, I have a guy here in the States named Akil. Akil is a track coach. I used to live near him. He does track coach. He gets paid a little bit of money for that, I'm sure. Nothing crazy, but it keeps him off the desk and it keeps him diversified a little bit. He also yeah. has a coaching business. Yeah. I think I'm big on personal branding. You know, So I tell people like, with digital marketing nowadays, go listen to Gary Vaynerchuk. You can easily start a personal brand and you can start a blog. I mean, of course, everybody here loves trading, but Garth, what else do you like doing? Like you like sports, you want to do a yeah. cricket blog. You want to like, you know what I mean? You can yeah. do, there's so much money out there. People just don't want it. You got to mm. want it. So if you want it, you can go all in on your trading, but you can be all in on trading while still having other streams of income. Make sure you yes. don't go on. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. the big thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Are, tra are successful traders born or or can anyone learn to do this? No, they're definitely not born because this is not like, this isn't like basketball where like you would have to be born tall and, and huge. And like, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that, that's where you could say like Shaq was born to play basketball. Like, look at him. You know what I'm saying? Traders, it, it's not definitely something you're born with. You have to be built into it. And I think that's why it's very difficult because you have to build yourself into this person hmm. who in a lot of cases does the opposite of what our human instinct, our DNA would want us to do. Like our human instinct tells us, hey, you want to, like in trading, especially it's the disposition effect where you want to hold your losers long and hope and cut your winners fast. So you just realize the game. Well, that's the mm. opposite of what we're supposed to do in trading. Uh, so yeah. to be good in trading, anybody can do it. It has to be someone who is coachable and they can rewire their brain. That's mm. the thing no one really talks about is like the best traders. None of them just walked onto wall street and figured it out. They yeah. had a mentor. They had a coach. Every single one of them had somebody who worked in the, on the pit, who worked on a floor, who worked somewhere. And they taught him how to trade. And you know that because that I know is similar to how you were brought up. You've had yeah. mentors in your life who have made yep. huge impressions. Yep. I had a guy on the podcast recently who was taught by a market maker at Goldman Sachs. Again, he's a now retail trader, not doing anything that he learned over there, but that experience, that coaching, that was his upbringing. Yeah. So I think that that's the key. Okay. All right, yeah. brilliant. All right, Austin, we, we're almost out of time. Um, it's gone very quickly, and I've really enjoyed speaking to you. But I knew I, I would because we we, uh, we we did well on your podcast when we spoke, and it was also a very quick and easy flowing conversation. But we are yes. running out of time. So uh, last question really is, yeah. is just how can listeners follow your work and get in touch with you and inquire about joining ASFX and all of the, the things that you do there? asfx.biz www.asfx.biz that's where you'll find everything all my socials the live streaming the mentorship everything we do is just in one place there Solid. like i said i try to keep it simple because i'm still focused on trading like i'm still focused on getting paid out and, and growing in the market so oh, let me fix that for you oh. that's my camera camera yeah, well, overheats yeah i saw that yeah <laughs> um i'm still focused on trading and, and being active in the market so for me this other stuff like the the business it, it's great and it introduces me to great traders, but like I want everyone to also understand like my number one thing is I'm trading. I'm not just because I know a lot of trading coaches, they stop trading. That's my experience. Yeah, a lot of guys that yeah. I used to work, I'm never going to do that, at least not until I'm like older and I maybe want to retire. I don't even know what things are going to be like then. So, like yeah, right now, yeah. my big thing is come watch me trade on ASFX TV. If you want to be a day trader, I can show you how to do that, or at least yeah. how I'm doing that. Brilliant. Okay. Fast, fantastic. Awesome. It's been a privilege and a pleasure to speak to you thanks very much for, Always. for coming on talking with traders today and uh we'll keep in touch and i'm sure we'll probably catch up again in in another year or two but oh, uh you, you keep well thanks very much for your time thank you garth thanks for joining us for today's episode of talking with traders brought to you by ig a world leading cfd provider we really are privileged to have such a leader in the field of online trading involved in this series. Please follow us on Facebook and engage with us there. And a reminder to make sure you subscribe to this series by clicking on the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we'd also appreciate if you'd leave a review on the app too. Till next time.